Hey everyone, Lexi Gavin here, and today we're going to go over tournament strategy. So let's jump right into the presentation here. So some things we're going to cover today. The differences between tournaments and cash games, because they are definitely two different animals. Tournament preparation, how we want to prepare for a tournament. The different stages of tournaments. Uh, there's early stage, middle stage, late stage. We're going to do a big focus on bubble play. Uh, different sectors, so different stack depth strategy. Harrington's M theory and Snapshove. Reentry strategy, satellite strategy, bounty strategy, selling action. And if we have time at the end, we will do some hand history review. So, how tournaments differ from cash games? Well, they're more exciting, in my opinion. <laughs> they're definitely, you're, they, uh, you're going to win more money, less frequently, but you're going to win big prizes. You can't really win $10 million in a cash game unless you're Dan Bilzerian playing million dollar pots. Um, there's fame, there's glory, there's cameras, there's bloggers, um, there's a lot of cool people, there's celebrities playing. So in my opinion, there's just nothing like the energy of a tournament, especially a series like the World Series of Poker. Um, so I think that they're more exciting. There are definitely higher variants, so you're going to make money less often, but the payouts are greater, like I said. So typically about 10 to 15% of the field usually makes the money, and first place is usually around 20% of the prize pool. So we're also going to go over the different uh, stages of the tournament. So you have early stage, middle stage, late stage. Um, we're going to do a big focus on the bubble play. Uh, chip preservation is vital. So every chip matters so much in a poker tournament. It's not like cash games where you can just buy more chips. You only have one tournament life. Um, unless it's a re-entry re tournament, then you have multiple lives in the beginning. But generally, you have one tournament life. Uh, so they're also much longer days. Um, I mean, of course, there's a lot of cash game players that will just grind from morning to morning the next day. But uh, typically, tournaments are, you want to consider them like a marathon. They are long days. They are grueling. They're hard on the body. Um, especially if you're away at the world series or something and it's tournament after tournament after tournament and, uh, you don't really get much of a break. So you definitely need to be in optimal mental and physical shape to be able to go out to the world series or WPT series or something and grind a full tournament schedule. And ICM, uh, is, you need to consider ICM as well. Uh, that's just the independent chip model. We'll go over that a little bit. So how can we prepare for a tournament? Well, you need to be well rested. Um, you Sleep is definitely super important uh, in a poker tournament. You need to be clear headed um, because if you're not, then you can uh, make a bad play and one bad play in a tournament can cost you the entire tournament. You need to have a healthy morning routine, breakfast, workout, meditate, yoga, whatever you need to do to feel zen. It's super important to set yourself up for success for the tournament. And having a healthy morning routine is uh, really helpful for that. You need to know the knowledge of the structure and how to adapt to it. So there's, you know, all different kinds of structures. You need to be patient in deep uh, and slow, slow structures and focus more on accumulation in those faster structures. You need to understand the different types of tournaments. So like I said, there's, you know, re-entry, bounty, satellite, all different kinds. Um, in general, I believe you should arrive on time, especially in re-entry and bounty tournaments because the weak players won't last. So you have, there's more value busting those, those players in the beginning because the really bad players uh, they come into a tournament, they're really excited, they want to just play a bunch of hands, and they are going to make a lot of mistakes in the beginning. Also, if you late reg, you're more likely to get a bad table draw because a lot of the pros are, uh, they do late reg, and 
um, some casinos will just start new tables with the late regers. So you definitely want to avoid that by registering the night before or, you know, arriving on time. Oh, registering the night before or di- early day uh, or early that day to get a bit better table draw. That's what I just said. And adapting to and exploiting player styles. So especially in the beginning, the beginning is when you should be um, really observing your table and making reads on your opponents and figuring out how to exploit them. So let's talk about the early stages of, we're talking mostly about freeze outs here. So let's talk about the early stages. Play is more reserved. Patience is key. You have less incentive to win pots early. Before the blinds and annies kick in, you really want to play um, more conservatively. You don't, like I said, every chip is so important in a tournament. So you really want to have patience when there's really not much to fight for. So again, early stages is for observation. It's time for making reads on your opponents. Uh, Deep stacked, again, you don't want to play huge pots early, especially if you're not in a re-entry tournament. Um, There's, like I said, just not as much incentive. Ranges are narrower in pre-ante levels, so don't make too many hero calls. Um, People, yeah, of course, the weak players are going to, you know, they're not going to understand that they should kind of play more reserved um, in the early stages. But you don't want to go crazy making big hero calls, just kind of, you know, play tight and, you know, understand your opponents and learn their tendencies and just chill in the beginning. Again, the field is softer in the early stages. You want to three bet a linear range only in early stages as well. You don't want to have too many um, polar three bets. You don't need to be three bet bluffing quite as often because again, there's there is not that much money in the middle and you have less incentive. And you don't want to be triple barrel bluffing too often in early stages as well. Um, again, just kind of take it easy. Just chill. Don't um, don't feel like you need to pull the triple barrel bluff on a person who just sat at the table or <laughs> anything like that. So yeah, no need for that. So let's talk about the middle stages now. So in the middle stage, play is faster and more aggressive. There's more volatility, so you need to open your ranges and fight harder for pots. So again, the blinds and antis have now increased. There's more incentive incentive to fight for pots. People are trying to build a stack as they near the bubble. So keep that in mind. Uh, there's a there is now a blind stealing um, dynamic, so you need to you know, really t- take down those blinds and annies so that you can build up your stack for the later stages. So you also need to defend the button wider. Um, you want to utilize your edge in position. So you are going to be making a lot more flats uh, from the button than you would in the early stages. You can open wider in later position. Uh, just again, uh, really important to win pots preflop. You can defend the big blind wider since, so since stacks are shallower in position, opponents can't mess with us as much as the early stages. So just like you are opening up a wider range, um, people are going to be opening up a wider range on your big blind as well. So it is important to defend that, uh, wider than in the early stages, Um, and understand that people are going to be C betting more frequently too. So you can mix in some check calls and check raises. Uh, you're going to want to three bet more aggressively. So again, try and take down that money post flop. People are playing a wider or a preflop. So, you know, people are playing a wider range, uh, and you want to, Utilize your skill edge. Your skill edge is still pretty high in the middle stages. In the early and middle stages, your skill edge is pretty high because there's a lot of weak players still in the field. As you um, approach the later stages, the, the field starts to get a lot tougher. So while you do have that skill edge, you should be um, trying to capitalize on that. 
And then post flop, you're going to have a high C bet frequency and a exploit opponents who fold too much. So a lot of players are going to play, um, you know, a wide range preflop, but then are going to be over folding on the flop. So try and pinpoint who those opponents are so that you can exploit them. And then also you're going to want to start check raise bluffing a little bit. Um, you have a pretty good stack to do it. Again, you want to try and build a stack for the bubble so that you're not shorter on the bubble. So now let's talk about the bubble. So some general tips for bubble play. Uh, you want to be aware who the threats are. So these are the big stacks. These are the people with egos that have a lot of chips that are going to um, try and abuse the bubble. So try and identify them. And you don't want to get into unnecessary ego wars on the bubble. Um, you know, it, it's hard to kind of sit back if you have a medium stack or a short stack. It's kind of hard to sit back and watch a big stack just kind of play every hand and, you know, take down every pot preflop. Um, a lot of people feel like they need to uh, fight back. And the bubble is just not the time to do it. Uh, just, you know, if you're kind of handcuffed to playing tight around the bubble, just let the big stacks do their thing. And once the bubble bursts, you can, um, you know, they'll start making more mistakes and you can start playing back at them a little bit. So around the bubble, you want to focus more on realizing your equity uh, than capitalizing. So you want to be checking back and pot controlling more instead of betting and uh, creating bigger pots. Because again, you don't want to be in too many big pots on the bubble. So if you're short, uh, I suggest stalling. Stalling, not excessively. You don't want to be one of those people that go into the tank and have to get the clock called on them every single time it's on you. But um, stalling is a thing in poker and it's okay. Like if you're short and you're near the money, um, stall reasonably, you know, don't take a minute every time, but, um, you know, just take a breath when it comes to you, take a breath, look at your cards, you know, think for a little bit and then fold. And you need to chill, breathe, relax. I know the bubble can be a stressful time, uh, when you're short, especially. So just kind of relax and understand that sometimes you are going to be the bubble boy or girl. Like you, you should be making a lot of folds and there are times where it is correct to fold hands like ace queen and ace king on the bubble, but you're never going to be folding pocket aces. You're, you know, rarely going to be folding pocket kings. That's more reasonable, but don't be the person that folds pocket aces just because you want to make the money. So just chill, relax, breathe. It's going to be okay. Uh, being the bubble boy is kind of like a rite of passage to poker. So don't, uh, yeah, don't stress about it. And there are always more tournaments. So, uh, more on the bubble play. So your strategy depends on your stack size. Again, if you have a big stack, you should be playing a lot of hands. If you are, uh, around the 30, 40 big blind range, you kind of just have to play pretty tight. Um, if you're very short, like under 10 big blinds and you're still like, you know, a significant amount of players away, like 15 or something players away from the money, um, you are probably not going to be able to fold to the money. So, I mean, if you are like, you know, five big blinds or something. So, um, just, you know, understand which hands you should be uh, shoving and which hands you should be calling off. Of course, it's always better to be the one shoving than calling off your stack. Um, it is definitely a scary thing to call off your stack on the bubble. But uh, so just try and understand how these different stack depths affect, um, you know, how you should be playing these various stack depths. Uh, and again, always be aware of everyone's stack size. So, um, you know, under just kind of understand the whole dynamic of the table and, and what people's strategy are depending on their stack size. Again, you want to avoid playing big pots. Be aware of the players who are folding 100% of the time. So like I said to you, don't be the person that folds aces on the bubble. There are players that fold aces on the bubble. <laughs> so 
be aware of who those people are. It's, um, you know, they're, they fold a hundred percent of the time. They're constantly looking at the clock. They're stalling a ton. So, um, be aware of those players. If you have a medium stack and you're on the button and the blinds are those players that are just folding hundred percent, then you should be opening hundred percent. Even if you have, you know, 25 big blinds, 20 big blinds, you can be opening hundred percent if you're at a very nitty table. I don't suggest doing that in an early position because of course, sometimes players are going to have hands, but, um, just, yeah, kind of be aware of how, you know, if you're at a super tight table and, and that's, you know, winning the blinds and andes around the bubble is a great way to increase your stack. So avoid trying to aggressively accumulate chips unless you are the big stack. Again, just play a bunch of hands if you are the big stack um, and just chill if you're not. So um, as a short stack, say 20 big blinds and under, you need to tighten up and try to cash, but you're not, but you don't want to pass up on an opportunity to get all the chips in with a premium hand. So if you do wake up with pocket kings or pocket queens or ace king or something and you have under 20 big blinds, Go for it, Um, you know, especially if there's a raise versus a big stack, understand that you are crushing their range. And uh, again, breathe, relax, understand that sometimes you are going to bubble, but that is a great spot for you to try and pick up chips. Um, If you're a middle stack, 25 to 40 big blinds, tight is right. Understand that the the big stacks are opening a huge range, so you kind of just have to chill. And if you're a big stack, play aggressively. If the table is tight, you can open almost 100% of hands. In really uh, nitty, you know, bubble tables, I have definitely played 100% of hands before when I had a lot of chips. And I'm talking like 8-3 suited under the gun. I know it's crazy, but um, if you have a lot of chips, you know that people are intimidated by you. You know that a lot of people want to cash. Um, it is correct to sometimes open a hundred percent of hands. I don't, not every time, but, um, you know, and, and if you have one or two, uh, you know, people at the table that aren't afraid of you, then I would definitely fold the eight, three suited under the gun. But if you're at a bunch of, you know, if you're at a table with a bunch of short stacks and they're all playing really nitty, then you can open a hundred percent of hands. So bubble big blind defense. So you want to defend your big blind tighter versus big stacks. <clears throat> you know, again, you don't want to, you want to avoid playing big uh, pots with bigger stacks and you're going to defend your big blind wider versus medium and short stacks. They kind of, they're, they're forced to play more straightforward um, at you on the bubble. So, and you don't want to just throw away your big blind. Like that is still your big blind. You still need to try and defend it. Um, especially if you're up against a stack size that matches you or shorter, um, nobody wants to play pots on the bubbles. So don't just fold your big blind, but try, you know, just kind of play ABC. So post flop bubble play. So ranges are strong, um, after, Sorry, ranges are strong if you do get um, to a post flop situation on the bubble. So, kind of you know be aware of that and understand that people don't really want to play post flop hands on the bubble. So, if there is a post flop situation, then their range is going to be strong. They're going to have something. Uh, there's little post flop play. Your C bet frequency goes down, so you don't want to make too many like bluffy C bets. Um, especially if you have like around the 30 big blind range, um, you just need to kind of play a little bit more straightforward. Um, so for example, if you have ace queen on the queen seven, four, you can check the flop because you really don't want to go broke with one pair. Um, so you need to also check back and pot control more with your draws. So you want to try and realize your equity instead of trying to barrel someone off their hand. So if you have a flush draw, a nut flush draw, and you're on the bubble, um, then you can check back and try and hit your hand. And, um, if you do brick and then, uh, if you do brick the flop and then your opponent's bets on the turn continues betting on the turn, then you can Um, you can probably call with your draw instead of having to call two streets. So if you had called the flop and then you bricked and then they continue barreling on the turn, 
um, then you're not going to want to fold, especially if you have the nut flush draws. So um, that's why checking back and trying to realize your equity on the flop is a good strategy on the bubble. Um, and then you want to avoid thin value bets um, and avoid, re- yeah, you want to avoid reopening the betting. So if you have, um, like, again, if you have top pair um, and you you think that you should be betting, um, try and only going for two streets of value or one street of value instead of three. Because if you do um, bet, then you're reopening the betting and then you're opening yourself up to the possibility of getting raised. And you don't want to, again, you're just trying to avoid the disaster of playing a big pot on the bubble. So if you do see bet, you want to choose a larger sizing. So again, you disincentivize people from check raising you um, or just raising you. So um, yeah, if you are going to see bet, try and choose a uh, at least a half pot more, you know, probably more like a 75% pot bet. Um, and if you do see that the flop, then you should be checking a lot of turns. So after the bubble bursts. So now let's talk about what happens after the bubble bursts. So yay, we're all in the money. <laughs> so after the bubble burst, uh, you're going to notice there's a lot of bus outs. Um, all of those people that were desperately trying to cash and, you know, squeeze in the money are now actively trying to get their chips in and double up. And a lot of people even shove incorrectly right after the bubble burst because they're just like so happy and that they've made it into the money and they're, they're short and they don't like care as much. They're just happy that they cash. So, uh, people are going to be shoving a little incorrectly, um, and yeah, so there's going to be a lot of bust outs. So you're going to go from, uh, being, you know, you know, right after the bubble burst to all of a sudden losing uh, a significant percent of the field. So, um, and then big stack bubble abuser needs to now pump the brakes. So that big stack that was opening a hundred percent of hands or, you know, a super wide range of hands probably should pump the brakes now. Um, understand that these short stacks are going to be going crazy. So you are going to have to, um, you know, call off these, call a lot of these all ins because you have the stack to do it, but you can also like, you shouldn't be raising every single hand because those people that were, on the bubble and just kind of dealing with you raising every hand are now going to probably try and play back at you. You know, those like medium stacks are probably not going to let you get away with it anymore. So, um, yeah, so I would definitely start pumping the brakes if I was opening a lot of hands, uh, high volatility. Again, there's going to be a lot of all ins, a lot of call offs. So, Um, this is a good time to kind of just sit back and let people bust and, um, yeah, kind of just chill and, uh, let, yeah, let people kind of get knocked out. Uh, so you don't want to do too much raise folding if there are a bunch of short stacks. So again, because these short stacks are going to be shoving a lot, um, you kind of have to tighten up a little bit if you're not willing and able to call off and all in. Uh, so you want to stay sharp again, a lot of people play poorly after the bubble burst. So just kind of stay in the zone and watch the action and, um, yeah, stay on your A game. Uh, you can limp some hands because people are less likely to shove over a limp. So I'm not a huge proponent of limping in general, but I do limp sometimes in late position. Like if it folds to me on the button and I have a marginal hand that, I, I don't, it's not necessarily strong enough to raise and certainly not strong enough to raise and then call a three bet. So if, uh, I, yeah, so I do like the idea of limping sometimes, um, when there are short stacks still left to act so that a, you know, you're giving a worse price for people to shove. Like when you raise to three times a big blind, then people have more incentive to shove and try and win those three big blinds that you've put in the pot. But if you limp, uh, first of all, limping just throws people off in general. So, um, you can definitely confuse your opponent and then you're giving them a worse price and less incentive to shove open over your limp. So 
right after the bubble burst, not a bad idea to limp some pots in position. And then you want to bluff catch post flop more because again, people are crazier. So those people that were just kind of fed up with you, uh, raising a lot of hands are now going to try and outplay you post flop. So, um, definitely be on the lookout for that. You're going to make thinner calls and bluff catch more. Again, go for a thinner value. People will also call you wider uh, because people are just trying uh, desperately to now build a stack up. So now uh, the later stage. So in the later stages of the tournament, uh, the intensity level is 100. Things start to get really intense. People are playing for a lot of money. The pay jumps become significant. So you can cut the tension with a knife, uh, but it's also very exciting. Uh, this is a super crucial time to stay off your phone. I know how tempting it is to put out on social media your progress of the tournament, but this is a time where everyone is going to be on their A game and you need to be paying attention to everything that happens at the table. So being on your phone can be a huge distraction. I'm definitely guilty of it. I, I tend to check the blog sometimes and I text updates to my friends and my family and I post on social media. So try and avoid doing that when you're in the late stages of the tournament. And every play matters. Uh, you want to have low volatility um, and bluff catch less and pass up on thin value spots. So like I said, Every single play is so crucial at this point of the tournament after the bubble burst when you're nearing final tables. Um, so you definitely don't want to take on as much variance, variance, especially if you have, if you know that you have a skill edge in the tournament, you should be more willing to pass up on higher variance spots and kind of pot controlling more and taking the lower variance line so that you can utilize your skill edge as the the field bins. And then uh, there's ICM considerations, pay jumps, lettering up. Uh, there's EV, there's expected value in folding. Um, so be aware of the pay jumps and which opponents sweat them. And it's kind of similar to bubble play. So it's really easy to figure out who, which of your opponents are just like sweating every single pay jump. And you shouldn't be this way. You shouldn't even really look at the pay jumps until you get super deep in the tournament and the pay jumps are really significant. But if it's like a few hundred bucks here, a few hundred bucks there, then don't even look at them because they playing, uh, and, you know, playing tighter around pay jumps can definitely um, cause you to make mistakes and you'll probably be overfolding. Um, so, yeah, I think this was actually a leak of mine. I think I was playing too tight around pay jumps, small pay jumps. So unless it's like $40,000 pay jumps, you know, $20,000 pay jumps, then I would just not sweat them. But it's uh, easy to figure out which one of your opponents are. Like they're constantly looking back at the action clock and or at the clock and and uh, like f tanking around pay jumps. So don't be one of those players and definitely exploit those players that are. Like you can definitely kick up the aggression versus the players that are just sweating every single pay jump. Uh, so then again, you want to utilize your skill edge, recognize if you have an edge and adjust your strategy accordingly. Um, so if you have less edge, uh, like if the field is tougher, then you want to do more uh, pre-flop aggression. So try and take down pots pre-flop without showdown by three bending more uh, and four bending. But if you have a higher edge, then you want to have more post-flop play. So more flatting pre-flop and utilizing your edge post-flop and applying pressure post-flop and using your uh, reads and your uh, and raging your opponents to your advantage. So if you're a big stack, adjust your strategy versus other big stacks. So there's an incentive to share responsibility of busting short stacks. I know that there's only one uh, winner in the tournament and everybody is, um, yeah, everybody is your opponent, but, um, and everyone's your competition, but you should, um, 
as you start to approach a final table, um, you don't want to mess around with big stacks as much. You want to allow the short stacks to kind of bust each other and you want to be sharing the responsibility of busting the short stacks. I mean, of course, it's optimal for you to bust every short stack, but that's just not realistic. So kind of, um, yeah, kind of share that responsibility until you get deeper. And accept your position and table draw. If you're at a final table and you have a big stack on your left, like that sucks. If you're just like, if you have the worst um, seat at the table, it happens. It's random. Just kind of deal with it and don't let it affect your game. Like I've definitely um, been guilty of this myself where I, I get to a final table and I'm just like, oh, shoot, you know, I have all the best players and all the deep stack, you know, all the big stacks on my left and all the short stacks on my right. Like just kind of accept it for what it is and adjust your strategy accordingly and not let it get to your head. So now let's talk about checking versus betting. So when our opponent has us covered, you need to check more to realize your equity. So uh, if if we're up against somebody who covers us, um, we want to do more pot controlling. Like I said, checking back more with your draws is, is more optimal when you are against somebody who covers you because you don't necessarily want to play for all of your chips uh, with just a draw if you have like uh, 30 30 to 40 big blinds or something and your opponent covers you. So yeah, check back, realize your equity when you are covered. Uh, When we have our opponent covered, we're going to try and bet and capitalize more and try and, um, you know, win, uh, win pots from them by charging them for their draws and getting them to fold their draws and, and try and capitalize on those spots. When we are in position, We want to bet and capitalize more. So obviously it's always better to be in position and we should be using our position um, by applying pressure on people out of position. And when we are out of position, we should be checking and trying to realize our equity more and pot controlling more. It's, uh, It's better when we're out of position to check call than to bet and then have to fold to a raise. So always try and play a little bit more pot controlly out of position. When we are trying to accumulate chips, uh, we need to bet and capitalize more. So when we do have a stack where we can kind of put pressure on people, then we should be um, betting more. And when we are trying to survive, um, we need to you check and realize our equity more. So if we have around 20, 25 big blinds and we are in a post-flop situation, we should definitely be checking more and not continuation betting with like middle pair or, or a weak top pair or something and then being in a really annoying spot if we get raised. So now let's talk about the different sectors. So I kind of made this up. Uh, I divided stack sizes into different sectors. So it's kind of easier to um like see (laughs) so i call sector one uh when you're about 38 big blinds and up so here you can open a wider range you have more playability um and yeah you could just get away with more uh stack preservation is still important there's a slow and steady growth and you can apply pressure to short and medium stacks so this is uh this is Now we have just moved on to general uh, stacks, uh, navigating different stack sizes. This isn't um, this isn't relating to the later stages of the tournament. So, um, yeah, so apply pressure to short and medium stacks and we can three bet a linear and a polarized range. So when we are shorter, we want to be more uh, linear heavy. And when we're uh, deeper, we can have a lot more um, bluffs in our three betting range as well. Sector two, we're around 30 to 38 big blinds. Stacks, preservation again, slow and steady growth. Uh, (laughs) Kind of weird. Uh, We're at a vulnerable stack depth. One wrong play can shift you down a sector, so you don't want that. You don't want to like make a bad C bet and then be forced to double barrel and then all of a sudden you're dropped down into the the 20-ish big blind range. 
So we need to be playing somewhat straightforward, take lower variance lines, and three bets should be mostly linear, but you can throw in some polar three bets in a later position. So sector three, we're at about 18 to 25 big blinds. Uh, so this is a vulnerable stack, stack death. One, one wrong play can shift us down a sector, which then we would be in straight survival mode. Um, we can still min raise fold at this stack depth um, in late position. I wouldn't really min raise fold in early position as much, but you can definitely get away with it in middle and late position. Uh, you still have pretty good fold equity with this stack depth. Um, so look for good, and you want to look for good spots to reshove. So um, hands with good removal uh, and blockers. So like ace high hands, king high hands are good reshove spots. But you pretty much want to be pretty nutted when you are reshoving um, with, a, with 18 to 25 big blinds. So don't, um, unless it's like folds to the button and you're in the small blind, and you have like ace nine suited and the button has been opening every single hand and the big blind only has like, you know, 20 big blinds himself. Like you can sometimes reshove there um, because you block their chances of having a strong ace x hand and you're just going to get fold so often and you are going to, you know, kind of punish the button for opening every single hand. Like you don't want them to just, you don't want to let them just run you over just because you're at a strange stack depth. And no polarized three bets, but you can shove over raise with blockers versus late position opener. So that's pretty much what I said. You don't want to like three bet. You don't really want to three bet fold at this stack depth. You really can't. Um, so if you are going to three bet, you have to be pretty nutted and can only do, you know, can only have a few polarized three bets in your range if you are versus, uh, like I said, people that are in late position that are opening 100% of hands. So sector four, now we're in 11 to 17 big blind range. So this is a spot where we're looking for an open shove. Um, you still have decent fold equity at this stage. And um, yeah, you don't want to raise fold too much between 11 and 15 big blinds. You still can. You still can min raise fold. Um, but I would rather look for spots that I could open shove with. Um, you can limp some cutoffs and buttons. So again, I know limping is kind of a strange concept, but it can actually be pretty effective if you have a hand that you don't necessarily want to raise. If you are up against, um, like if you are in late position, say the cutoff or the button, and you are up against people that are really tight in the blinds, you can um, you can get away with some limps because you know that they're not gonna like isolate you as wide. Like people get like I said, people get very confused about what to do versus limpers. <laughs> so um, they don't necessarily like shut. They don't have as much incentive to shove over a limp as if you were to raise. So you can limp some cutoffs and buttons and see some some pots post flop. And if you if you do hit a top pair, then you're most likely not folding. You can still min raise fold, uh, min raise fold in middle and late position. So again, we just talked about that. So now we are in sector five, which is 10 big blinds and under. Um, you definitely want to take into consideration your pu push fold charts like Snapshove and uh, Harrington's M charts, which we'll go over in just a little bit. Uh, you don't have a lot of fold equity, so understand that you are going to get called quite a bit. And in big blind anti-tournaments, you need to shove wider in early position because you, if you're like under the gun and you only have 10 big blinds, then you're, the next hand you're going to be um, anteing your big blind and the big blind ante. So um, suddenly you're going to be you know, from 10 big blinds to eight big blinds, and then you're going to go through the small blinds. So you definitely have to shove a wider range um, under the gun if it is a big blind anti tournament. And at five big blinds and under, you are going to be priced in uh, pretty much most of your big blinds. Um, like if you have a hand like seven deuce, you can consider folding, you can fold with five big blinds, but um, you are going to be priced in with a lot of your range at five big blinds and under. 
So now let's talk about uh, ICM. So what is ICM? It is the independent chip model. So this calculates a player's equity in dollars based on their stack size. So it gives a dollar amount basically to their stack size. And it measures a person's likelihood of finishing in each, each position. So it'll tell you how what the chances are of you winning in first place, second place, third place, etc. So um, there's going to be a lot of situations where, um, like, at, like as you're approaching huge pay jumps and final table bubbles and stuff, where there are going to be ICM considerations. So where, you know, in the earlier and middle stages of a tournament where, you know, it may be correct to open a certain hand, um, it might be incorrect to open that same hand um, when there are ICM considerations. So you definitely need to be um, passing up on um, these, you know, these significant ICM spots um, when you can. So now let's talk about Harrington's M theory. So... Um, basically your M theory are just your like push fold charts, like the, your optimal push charts. Um, so what you do to figure this out is you take the cost per orbit. So you take the blinds and antes, and then you divide it by your stack. And then this will give you a number from 10 to one. And, um, then you need to take that number and refer to your M charts to figure out what um, umbrella of ranges you can shove from at each M levels. So say, for example, you have 10,000 chips and the blinds are 1,000, 2,000 with the 2,000 big blind ante. So you take the 2,000 big blind plus the 2,000 big blind ante plus the small blind, which is 1,000, and that's 5,000. Then you take your stack, 10,000, divide that by or take the 5,000 divided by your stack, 10,000, no, the 10,000, sorry, divided by your 5,000 stack, and then that's an M of two. So then you go here, and I suggest um, getting these M charts, and then so you go down, you have an M of two, and these are all of the hands that you should be shoving at an M of two. So basically, you can survive two orbits before you go broke. So you should be shoving uh, pocket deuces and up from the small blind and uh, from the hijack, um, you know, seven, six suited and up, you know. So, well, I mean, from the small blind, sorry, four do suited and up. And then from the hijack, seven, six suited and up. So, um so this is just something that I refer to. Not everybody uses the M charts. Um, there are you can you can go by the Nash equilibrium push fold charts and um, use programs like Snapshove, which we will get into uh, right after this. So um, I like using the M charts; they've always worked for me. So now uh, we can talk about Snapshove. Snapshove is, is something you can download, I believe, for free, and basically. It'll tell you um, which hands you can be shoving profitably at which big blind depths. And um, if you purchase like their premium, um, their premium uh, program, then you can figure out, you can uh, do your reshoves and, and call offs and stuff like that. Um, so say, for example, we're at a six handed table and we have eight big blinds and say it's a one-tenth big uh, anti-size so say we're in the low jack we hit calculate and we can shove 13 percent of hands from the low jack in uh with for 18 big blinds profitably so you can kind of just play around with this uh, you could switch up the number of players um and switch up your big blinds 12 switch up positions so this is something that I recommend playing with just to kind of get a better idea of which hands you should be shoving. So now let's talk about the different types of tournaments. So we have re-entry strategy. So in re-entries, people play much looser during the rebuy period. So you need to make looser calls and bluff catch more. Um, people are going to try and build a stack in, during the rebuy period, especially if it's a lower buy-in like the like the $200 buy-ins or something or $500 buy-ins. I notice people play way crazy and just try and fire maximum bullets so that they can build a stack. Um, you don't want to bluff too much during the re-entry period because, again, people are going to be calling you wider because they're trying to chip up. 
Uh, so now let's talk about satellites. Uh, so a satellite is a tournament where the prize is to a seat to a larger buy-in tournament. Or uh, you have step satellites where you, it's basically like qualifier rounds. So you can play a satellite to get to the next step to a better satellite and then eventually win your way to a seat. So with satellites, you either lose everything or win everything. There's nothing in between. So uh, it's not like um, there's payouts. You either win a seat or you don't. So tight is right. Play is much more reserved and the bubble can take a long time. I've been in satellites where the bubble's taken hours. So um, definitely try and accumulate chips before the bubble so that you don't have to sweat the bubble as much. Um, your strategy sh should depend on the stacks around you. So um, if you're a big stack and you're approaching the bubble, um, you don't really have too much incentive to try to play, um, you know, in, in pots with middle stacks and you don't really have too much incentive to even call off all ins, um, especially if like you're on the direct bubble or two away. Like there's no reason to like risk your chips when you're pretty, you're guaranteed to seat pretty much uh, if you just sat there and folded. And if you're a middle stack, like don't try and um, play pots with big stacks or other middle stacks. Just kind of try and let the short stacks dwindle down and get eaten by the Andes or bust. So folding aces can be correct on the bubble. This is a crazy concept. I told you not to fold aces on the bubble before earlier in this presentation, but if you are in a, a satellite tournament, you certainly should. Um, there's just no incentive to play hands if there are very short stacks and you're approaching the bubble because you're like, there's no reason to risk chips when you're guaranteed a seat pretty much. So bounty tournaments, bounty tournaments are so much fun. Uh, this is where you, uh, when you knock out a player, you win a prize, uh, most likely money, unless it's like a charity event. Uh, you have less fold equity in bounties because people are going to try and come after your bounty. So pretend you're playing with the big dollar sign on your forehead. That's how people see you. Um, you want to arrive on time. So the reason for this is because um, the most money is in the early stages of the tournament, right? Like, I mean, obviously the, the first place prize when you win is going to be huge, but money gets taken out of the prize pool as the tournament progresses. So all of the money is in there in the beginning. So you want to arrive on time and try and win as much money as possible and not arrive late and have a decent portion of the prize pool taken out. So you want to play an aggressive style so that you can have your opponents uh, covered. So it's always good to have your opponents covered in bounty tournaments so that you are not vulnerable to... Um, you know, getting called lighter because you are, you know, your bounty is at stake. So try and have your opponents covered. I know that's easier said than done. So now quickly, uh, let's talk about selling action. I talked about this in the last presentation I did on the poker lifestyle, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but um, it's really important to sell action if you are going to play tournaments. They're very expensive. You're only going to... Um, you're only going to cash a tournament about 15 to 20% of the time if you're really good. So they add up very quickly. Um, so I definitely recommend selling action, especially if you're playing in larger buy-ins. So uh, some ways to sell action are to individuals, friends, uh, word of mouth. Just go to your buddy, go to your neighbor. Um, if you're at a poker table, offer your action at the poker table. You can sell, oh, and you can sell for in, um, individual tournaments. I think that's what I meant. <laughs> um, so individual events. You can also make a package. So you, um, what you would do is you would add up every tournament that you play, and then you can charge whatever markup that you've decided to play. So if you're playing, um, you know, 10 $100 tournaments um, and you decide to charge a 20% markup, then, then now the whole value of the package is $1,200, not $1,000. And then you would sell individual pieces for that. So if somebody wanted 10%, they would give you $120 uh, for those tournaments. So you can do that. Or you can be nice and not charge any markup at all. Um, I wouldn't feel guilty about charging markup. It's part of the biz. Um, it covers travel costs and all other unforeseen costs. 
and helps you pay for the buy-in yourself. And then you can use staking platforms like Ustake and Stakings. Um, again, if you were interested in using one of those, I did it um, in my last presentation on the poker lifestyle and I went through and walked uh, w- walked through the process of selling action on a staking platform. So check that out. And that is it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation and um, learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to get at me at Lexi Gavin Poker on social media and head on over to LexiGavin.com to check out what I'm, you know, what I'm doing lately and all that jazz. So thanks guys for watching and I will talk to you soon. Bye.